Hello, this is Sachi Inari Rizzo, curator of prints and drawings. Every other month, I present a gallery talk in the Print and Drawing Study Center. For this season's print room talks, I've been focusing on works by artists whose lives have intersected, including married couples, siblings, and extended families. Last month, we looked at the works of Fort Wayne's extraordinary Hamilton family. Today, we will be looking at permanent collection works by Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, and Francisco Mora. We will first begin with Elizabeth Catlett. Catlett was born in 1915 in Washington, D.C. She understood the importance of education early on. Her mother worked in the public schools and her father had been a professor at Tuskegee Institute. Catlett attempted attendance at Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh. However, she was denied admission since she was black. Instead, she went to Howard University where she graduated cum laude in 1936 with a BS in art. Howard was a pioneer as the first art department in a historically black university. Catlett studied under American regionalist painter Grant Wood at University of Iowa. In 1940, she became the first student granted an MFA in sculpture at the university. Wood is best known for his painting American Gothic. On the screen now, we have a lithograph typical of his optimistic views of the heartland. So what was Wood's impact on Catlett? His meticulous process and particularly his philosophy about art resonated with her. He made a deceptively simple statement. It should be something that you know the most about. And Cat, for Catlett, that meant exploring her identity as a woman, an African-American, and later a Mexican citizen. Catlett spent the summer of 1941 in Chicago between her first and second year teaching at Dillard University. She rented a room from artist Margaret Burrow, whose work we see here. They met during Catlett's pilgrimage to see a major exhibition of Pablo Picasso's work. She studied ceramics at the Art Institute of Chicago and lithography at the Southside Community Arts Center. That summer, Catlett also met the painter Charles White, whom she wed in December. Catlett and White took part in the many artist gatherings associated with the Southside Community Arts Center. White was born in Chicago in 1918 at the age of seven, his mother bought her son an oil paint set and took him regularly to the Art Institute of Chicago. He attended Englewood High School along with Margaret Burroughs. In 1937, White accepted a scholarship to attend the Art Institute of Chicago. He had received other offers from the Academy of Fine Arts and Miser Academy of Art, only to find later that the scholarships were withdrawn when it became known that he was Black. In 1938, White began working for the easel painting department and then the mural diversion of the WPA's Illinois Art Project, part of the New Deal. In this photo, we see White working on a large painting for the George Cleveland Hall Library, which was an important part of his youth. The library was a resource for books that opened up a world of the contributions and the history of African-Americans in the same way, White's murals brought attention to significant achievements of Black Americans, largely absent in art and history. After marrying Catlett, the couple taught at Dillard University. White received a Julius Rosenwald fellowship that allowed them to move to New York City, where they both attended the Art Students League from 1942 to 43. Living in Harlem, they discovered a creative community, including Duke Ellington, Ralph Ellison, and Langston Hughes. In 1946, Catlett received a Rosenwald Fellowship that brought them to Mexico, a welcoming environment to African-Americans. They lived in the home of Mexican muralist David Alfaro Sequeiras. The two had hoped to assist the muralists, but the project funding was cut after arriving in Mexico City. Previously, while in New York for an exhibition of the Popular Graphic Arts Workshop, Mexican artist Jose Chavez Morado persuaded Catlett to join the collective. Catlett became a permanent member and White an honorary member of the Popular Graphic Arts Workshop, which was a socially minded printmaking collective. In 1949, she and Mariana Yampolsky were the only female members. The collective was pivotal in Catlin and White's devotion to creating art about and for the people. 
White honed his skills in lithography with Securus and linoleum cut with Leopoldo Mendez. Linoleum block prints were attractive since they do not require a printmaking press or special equipment. They became White's medium of choice during the 1950s. While it does not lend itself well to creating continuous tonal transitions, White used this quality to his advantage to make bold statements. The influence of Mendez's expressive style and delicately gouged manner of modeling is seen in The Negro Speaks, 1949. White's subject is an older man with furrowed brows and heavy-lidded eyes, suggesting a sage elder. White enjoyed the use of exaggeration. His subject has po large, powerful hands, ones that have probably seen much labor. That gesture, that gesture as if to provide advice. His head is cropped slightly, giving him a monumental presence that is enhanced by the light that emanates from behind him. The title calls to mind Langston Hughes's 1920 poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, that the poet wrote on his train ride to Mexico. Hughes's poem makes connections to Black people's ancestral past in the beginnings of human civilization. Interestingly, White drew a sketch of the poet during a 1938 lecture at the George Cleveland Hall Library and asked Hughes to autograph it. White admired Hughes's work and owned a copy of his collabor collaboration with photographer Roy de Caraba in The Sweet Fly Paper of Life that documented everyday life in Harlem in the 1950s. Later, White painted an homage to Langston Hughes in 1971. By 1947, the couple returned to New York with their marriage ending shortly afterwards. White continued to work in a realistic, figurative style that engaged with history and the politics of the era. A skillful draftsman, in 1972, White became only the second African-American elected a member to the National Academy of Design. In 1965, he became the first Black faculty member at the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles and continued to teach there for 25 years. He was a teacher and mentor to a younger generation of artists, including David Hammonds and Carrie James Marshall. I Am the Black Woman, 1946 to 47, was Catlett's first work with the Popular Graphic Arts Workshop in Mexico City. She was greatly influenced by an epic print series presenting the history of the Mexican Revolution that they published in 1947. It was a portfolio of 85 lino cuts with narrative titles and expanded text. It embodied the emotion, courage, and sacrifice of the Mexican Revolution from the viewpoint of the people. She borrowed this format to tell her own historical story of African-American struggle, perseverance, and hope in America through the experiences of women. I Am the Black Woman is a series of 14 prints. It was unprecedented for its time as a representation of African-Americans and their history, and even more so through the lens of women. The print honors famous heroines along with the unknown, ordinary individuals who perform feats of courage in small ways on a daily basis. Key to the power of this series is Catlett's skillful narration in her titles, which are all in first person. When read together, they form a narrative poem. For a brief moment, the viewer takes the role of the artist slash narrator and proclaims, I am the black woman, and moves title by title, event by event through the series. This is the first print entitled, I am the black woman. I have always worked hard in America, in the fields. In the fields depicts a woman laboring on a farm using stark bold lines to describe the worker. Catlett bestows her a monumental presence in the foreground as long rows of crops recede into the horizon, alluding to endless toil. In other folks' homes, I have given the world my songs. I have given the world my songs is one of the few works in the series printed in two colors. A seated woman holds a guitar and again is depicted with strong contours. The blue colored imagery in the background is the inspiration for the blues with the Ku Klux Klan violent attack and cross burning. In Sojourner Truth, I fought, I fought for the rights of women as well as Blacks. Born Isabella Bomfrey to an enslaved family in Ulster County, New York, 
Sojourner Truth was a skilled orator and impassioned activist who spent her life fighting for the rights of African Americans and women. Cat Lisper's trail is formidable. Her body fills the composition and she doesn't hesitate to meet our gaze. So, Truth was, has somewhat oversized hands reminiscent of Charles White. They exude strength and resolve. One points heavenward while the other grasps the podium. Similar to the Prince of the Mexican Revolution, Cat, Catlett relied on famous images as her sources, since they would be easily recognizable. Truth's features, striped dress, and white head wrap are all reminiscent of the engraved frontispiece to the book Narrative of Sojourner Truth, published in 1850, in which Truth dictated to the abolitionist Olive Gilbert. In Harriet Tubman, I have helped hundreds to freedom. In 1869, Sarah Hopkins Bradford wrote a book about Tubman to help raise money for her. The biography entitled Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman made the conductor one of the most famous women of her era. This engraving on the right by an unknown artist was used as the frontispiece for the book. This image may have given Catlett some ideas for her portrayal, however, it would be difficult to find one with Tubman in action. It's difficult not to make comparison between Catlett and German Expressionist printmaker Kata Kalfas. In her politically charged work, Outbreak, the subject is a female revolutionary during the Peasants' War. In Catlett's depiction, Tubman is a towering presence although she was not much taller than five foot two inches. Like Colvis's print, arm gestures are important as well. Tubman extends her arm and points to give direction. It is also placed strategically above her group of followers in the composition, like they are under her protection. In Phyllis Wheatley, I proved intellectual equality in the midst of slavery. For this print, Catlett highlights the literary achievements of Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first African-American enslaved woman to have her writings published. In Catlett's print, Wheatley sits at a table holding a quill pen, her head resting on her, the other hand, lost in thought. The composition is inspired by an engraving that was used as the frontispiece for the book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religion and Moral, 1773. Many historians believe the creator of the print is Scipio Moorhead, an enslaved man of African descent who lived near the author in Boston. Catlett deviates from the engraved portrait by adding three anonymous women in chains in the background, perhaps alluding to Wheatley's literary triumphs over enslavement. My role has been important in organizing the unorganized. Catlett focuses our attention on a woman perhaps a labor organizer who raises a clenched fist. A sense of their solidarity is conveyed with the oval composition and the four workers who surround her, one of whom reads a printed leaflet. My reward has been bars between me and the rest of the land. I have special reservations, special houses. These three prints speak to experiences that African-Americans faced, including segregation on public transportation and housing. To give you a sense of timing, Catlett produced I Have Special Reservations nine years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white person on a Montgomery, Alabama bus. Using the word special in a sarcastic way adds a bite to the works. Catlett faced these limitations herself. For example, at University of Iowa, Black students were not permitted to live in the dormitories. In all of the images, the figures are pushed up close to the borders, adding to the feeling of restriction and a special fear for my loved ones. This Lido cut portrays the violent public murder of a person accused of a crime but given no trial. An African-American victim lies sprawled on the ground with a rope used to hang him still tight around his neck. Three pairs of feet stand above the man's head, possibly belonging to his attackers, to bystanders, or maybe to family members who have come to retrieve the body of their loved one. By pushing the feet of the man to the very edge of the image, the artist also places us, the viewer, at the scene. We are forced to see firsthand the disturbing reality of what has happened. 
the curved pattern of heavy black and white marks that define the image also add a sense of urgency, enhancing the drama of this moment. Events such as this were common in the South during the time this work was created. According to records kept by the Tuskegee Institute, just under 3,500 African Americans were lynched between 1882 and 1968, with the majority of attacks taking place in the South. Lynchings were usually racially motivated attacks carried out by groups of men as an act of social control. My Right is a Future of Equality with Other Americans ends the series on an aspirational note about the future as the woman looks upward. As you can see, Catlett's prints were used to illustrate an edition of Lift Every Voice and Sing by James Weldon Johnson, considered the Black National Anthem by the NAACP. In 1947, Catlett established her permanent residence in Mexico and married Mexican artist Francisco Mora. Through the years living in Mexico, she never lost her connection with the Black community in the U.S. and at the same time felt very connected with her adopted country. Francisco Mora was born in Mexico in 1922 and was exposed to the arts early in life. His father was a musician and his mother worked in textiles. In 1940, he studied at the University of San Nicolas de Hidalgo until he moved to Mexico City with the following year where he studied with Diego Rivera. At that point, he became involved with the Popular Graphic Arts Workshop, which taught him about how art could be a catalyst for social and political change. Mora met Catlett in 1946, and they were married in 1947. Mora became interested in the subject of mining in 1945 when he received a commission from the Associated American Artists to produce a series of lithographs about the subject. Associated American Artists was a New York-based gallery that specialized in original works of art at affordable prices for the middle class. A year later, Mora traveled to Pachuca and spent time in the mines observing people at work. His portfolio named Las Minas recorded the long days and intense labor of work of workers. In 1946, the People's Graphic Arts Workshop published a portfolio entitled Mexican People that included 12 lithographs by different artists depicting work scenes in Mexico. The Mexican People portfolio includes descriptions that explain the subject of work in each print and from different regions in Mexico. Mexico is rich in silver deposits and was historically excavated by hand. While the Mexican people portfolio is overall very positive in outlook, Mora took a, an opportunity to reveal the dangers in silver mining. Miners often worked in hazardous conditions. The tunnels were tight with inadequate ventilation and drainage. In Mora's lithograph, a miner with a grim look on his face walks hunched over, attesting to the low height of the passageway. In an earlier print, the, work, the working space is so confined that Mora's miner crawls on his stomach. The miner wears a helmet, but is shirtless and only wears shorts and sandals, insufficient clothing for the job. Catlett and Mora had three sons together. When the children were young, Catlett focused on printmaking, which lent itself well to being done at home. She soon resumed sculpture. In this slide, we see what looks to be a preparatory sketch for a sculpture. Catlett studied with sculptor Zadkin in New York for six months in 1942. She also studied with sculptor Francisco Zuniga at La Esmeralda in Mexico City. He was known primarily for figurative work, especially of women, an example of one of his prints is on the right. Catlett continued to explore the subject of women in stone, terracotta, bronze, and polished wood. Her sculptural work often reprised motherhood, making universal statements rather than overt social comments as seen in her prints. A couple of years ago, I was in conversation via email with an art dealer who had a sculpture by Catlett for sale. After seeing the image, I wondered if our drawing could be related to it. The drawing provides insight into the working process of a sculptor. The head is viewed from multiple perspectives in an effort to visualize the finished piece. 
It is a prime example demonstrating how Catless simplified forms and planes in her depictions of the human figure in three dimensions. Mora and Catlett enjoy talking about their works with one another and were supportive of each other's careers. They both remained members of the workshop until 1966 and enjoyed 55 years together in marriage. Thank you for joining me today. Check back on Wednesday, March 16th, when we look at the works by Jackson Pollock and his brother Charles from the Permanent Collection. <music>